Hi, I'm Michael Laurie. I'm here to talk to you today about the benefits of native plants. There's many benefits. One of them is low maintenance. And that's because a lot of these natives grew up around here over thousands of years. And so they are used to growing around here with the kind of climate we have and the type of soil. So much less maintenance than some of the um, imported plants. Beauty, a lot of them are very beautiful. Uh, you're gonna see some pictures later of red flowering currant. There's a lot of other ones. Oregon grape has beautiful yellow flowers. Healthy, and what I mean by that is that um, because a lot of these native plants, people don't typically use pesticides with them, then uh, it's, it's a healthy, safe place to be versus sometimes people put a lot of pesticides on their lawn or with other plants. And so those pesticides can be harmful to us and our pets and children. Not a good thing. Native plants can help uh, with the climate change. You know, as we all know, that's a really big problem now, but a lot of the native plants um, can pull carbon dioxide out of the air, put it in their body, put it in the soil, and again, a lot of other plants can do that, but the natives are adapted to doing that around here, so they're pretty good at doing that in our climate. Conserving water is another benefit because a lot of these plants uh, have grown up and, and evolved and been around for thousands of years, far longer than we were around here with our irrigation systems. So they don't, a lot of them don't need much water except maybe in the first couple years when you're establishing them. And, and also, in terms of saving water, you really wanna put the plants, the plants that like the shade in the shade, and the plants that like the sun in the sun. And that will help in terms of the water conserving aspect. And finally, big thing is a lot of these native plants attract beautiful wild, native wildlife, birds, insects, butterflies, um, bees, so it can be wonderful to be able to look out the, the windows of your house into your native plant garden and see different kinds of birds and other insects coming through throughout the year. Hi, I'm Diane Emerson. I'm Michael Laurie's wife. We work together on these kinds of projects with Garden Green. And I want to tell you about a person who has really inspired me. In addition to Michael, there's another man. Its name is Doug Tallamy. He is the professor and chair of the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. He wrote a book called Bringing Nature Home. And in this book, he said something that was incredibly inspiring to me. It was all about the insects. He has spent many years studying the decline and the loss of species, especially in insects and birds. And he has discovered a lot of information about it and why they're disappearing. So when I was growing up in the Midwest, I would see monarch butterflies. And I was always really, found it fascinating that this beautiful butterfly was so dependent on one species of plant for its caterpillars to eat. It only eats milkweed. That's all it will eat. And, and that was a really cool thing about, about monarchs. But Doug Tallamy's research has indicated that it's, that's not the exception, it's the rule. He's found that up to 90% of all the pollinators, all the butterflies and the moths, are totally dependent on one species of plant for their survival. So, that explains why we are losing so many of our, of our species. And I would like to read to you a quote from him, from Doug Tallamy. Doug doesn't pull his punches when he talks about this subject. Here's his, his quote. Unless we modify the places we live, work, and play to meet not only our own needs, but the needs of other species as well. Nearly all species of wildlife native to the United States will disappear forever. This is not speculation. 
It is a prediction backed by decades of research on species area relationships by ecologists who know of what they speak. And the extinction of our plants and animals is not a scenario lost in the distant future. It is playing out across the country and the planet right now. So that is why we're here today planting a bunch of wonderful, beautiful native plants native plants that co-evolved here in community, native plants that are used to our wet winters and our dry summers, and as Michael said, our soils. These are what we should be planting for the future of our ecology and our life. And there are many, many beautiful native plants that will do very well in our gardens. Over 250 species of native plants are quite suitable to be used in our gardens. And I would like to talk with you about and show you some of my favorites. So now I'd like to share with you some of my favorite native plants. And um, one of the things that I really like is the our native sword fern. Look at how, look at the length of this frond. These sword ferns can live up to 75 years long. Isn't that amazing? They're like old growth plants. And they are highly underrated as plants on our, in our community. And they're incredibly versatile. These guys can grow in the sun, they can grow in the shade. And they're, once they're established, they're really quite drought tolerant. And one of the interesting things about these guys is that they are very, very good at holding slopes. They have extensive root systems, they're evergreen, and as you drive around Bashan Island, where we live, you'll see it's the sword ferns that are really doing a great job at holding those really steep slopes on, uh, around the island. Now I'd like to share with you red flowering currant. This is another beautiful native plant, and it happens to be blooming right now. Beautiful flowers. And if you have one of these shrubs on your property, and if, it's, if you're close to it, to a window, you'll see that the hummingbirds are coming for it. The hummingbirds love this plant. And uh, we are fortunate to have one near our dining room window, and we get to see the hummingbirds when they come visit. Here's another beautiful native plant. This is called kinnikinnik. And this is a ground cover for sunny areas. It uh, is evergreen and it has berries. Another name for this plant is bearberry. So the berries are edible, at least the bears like them. I don't know if they're edible for us or not. They are bright red berries in the fall. So this is another beautiful native plant, wonderful as a ground cover. This one is called oxalis. This is another wonderful ground cover that's pretty much evergreen, but one of the special things about this plant is that its leaves are edible. It has a bit of a lemony flavor, so I like to harvest these leaves for our salads, and we put them in our salads. So it's useful for us, and it has lovely flowers as well. Grows in semi-shade, and is a very, very nice ground cover. This is another fern, another evergreen fern, like sword fern, but much smaller. And this is a deer fern. So if you don't have enough space for one of those big sword ferns, here's a, here's a great choice for uh, a place for an evergreen fern in your landscape. This is deer fern. This one is evergreen huckleberry. It looks very similar to the kinnikinnik, only this one gets to be a pretty tall shrub. Not really tall, maybe eight, 10, eight or 10 feet tall eventually. It's relatively slow growing, but there, this plant is incredibly valuable for wildlife. It has edible berries that are good for us to eat. They're really nice, very delicious. And it holds onto its berries throughout the winter and early spring. So we've noticed that we've seen, we have a bush like this outside our dining room window, and we see that the birds come and visit it almost all year round because it holds on to those little berries and so there's always something there for the birds to eat. 
So it's also just beginning to get ready to bloom at this time of year. This little plant is our native bleeding heart. It has flowers that look like little bleeding hearts and it is, uh, forms a wonderful ground cover about, about 10 inches tall and its flowers will bloom pretty much all summer long if it's kept moist and, and watered or, or grown in the shade. And it's a beautiful light spring green and it keeps that green, light green color and uh, it's, it's very, very charming. And it's, I like the way the leaves come up in the spring and the, the way it looks as it's unfolding. This plant is wild ginger. This plant loves the shade. On our property, this plant is cr uh, creeping in underneath the sword ferns. It likes shade that much. And it forms a beautiful carpet of evergreen, big evergreen leaves, sometimes as much as six inches across, and in a lovely, lovely carpet of, of green. And it has an unusual flower. It's in bloom right now in early spring. With, with this strange little flower that has been likened to some kind of a sea creature. So this is the wild ginger and it is edible and usable like, um, like ginger is to some degree. This little plant is called sea thrift. For those of you who have sunny spots in your garden, this is a lovely plant. It will form a clump, uh, maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 inches tall. And it, when it blooms, it has little pink flowers and balls that stick up above the foliage. And it will bloom most of the summer if it likes where it is in a nice sunny spot. And that's sea thrift. You may not know, but we actually have native strawberries here too. This is one of them. This one is the beach strawberry. It has lovely leathery leaves, unlike the strawberries that you might be familiar with. And it forms a wonderful, wonderful ground cover in a sunny spot. And uh, it does have little tiny strawberries on it and lovely flowers. And it's a really lovely native ground cover. So those are some of my favorite native plants. Now it's your turn. Here's an idea for you. The next time you go to a plant nursery, next time you visit one, ask the staff there to show you their native plants. Even if they don't have any, they're gonna be, they're gonna remember that. And they'll say, gee, maybe we should have more native plants in our selection. And when you do see the native plants that they have, consider buying some native plants next time and bringing them home and planting them in your landscape. That would be great. And finally, I would just like to thank the King County Wastewater Treatment Division for financing this video and our research and in conjunction with the Vashon Nature Center and Garden Green. See you around. I would like to read to you a quote from him, from Doug Tallamy. Oops. Cut. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes indeed. <laughs>